Safety webinar. I'm Michael Place, Training Director for the Supply Group and Chairman of ASA's Safety Committee. Almost monthly, the committee publishes articles and toolbox talks on a variety of safety subjects. These can be viewed and downloaded from the ASA site at www.asa.net. Also available on the ASA site are recordings and downloads of previous webinars. All of these items are available free to the public. To view these resources, look for the Safety Resources link on the ASA homepage, which is located at www.asa.net. If you have any problems, contact Dan Hilton at the ASA for assistance. I'd like to draw your attention to ASA's supplier partners shown on the screen and thank them for their industry leadership in supporting the Safety Committee and these webinars. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. Everyone that registered for the webinar will receive an email notifying them when and where the replay of the webinar is available. Attendees will also receive a link to its location. All attendees are in mute mode. To submit a question during the presentation, you can enter it in the chat window. Before you send it, be sure your setting is set to send the question to our organizers and the panelists so we can see the question. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. Also, a FAQ document with all questions and answers will be posted on the ASA site along with the replay of the webinar. Other related documents will be posted in that location as well. I would now like to turn our attention toward today's event. The presentation title is The ABCRs of Fall Protection. Our presenter for this webinar is John Eckel, Senior Technical Training Specialist for Miller Fall Protection. John is an industry leader in fall protection training and for providing guidance on the use of fall protection equipment. A full bio of the presenter will be posted with the webinar documents on the ASA site. I now turn the presentation over to John Eckel. Okay, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. So I'd like to take the time here to thank Dan, Bill, and Mike for the from the American Supply Association for giving Miller Fall Protection by Honeywell an opportunity to provide this webcast. So um, the webcast uh, will concentrate on working at height, especially for um, warehousing, distribution, manufacturing, and uh, maintenance personnel. That would be what we call the general industry and the safety industry. So. Um, as Mike said there, if you have any questions, um, please uh, submit your questions, and I will try to get to those after the, if we don't get to them at the end of the Q&A here, then we'll try to get to them and uh, submit those back. Um, the first slide I have up here is dealing with, and I don't want you to get hung up so much on the numbers that you see there. This, this uh, document or this picture that you see actually comes from the Department of Labor from OSHA. And what I want to show is if you look at the numbers or the column on the left-hand side, 11%, it says less than six feet. And those are actually the fatalities, and this was 2013, for the different height that people were working and where the fatalities come from. So if you, if you take the highs and put them with the lows, if you look at those, those almost average out. So when we take a look at the working at height and where people are dying, it's pretty much even across the board if you get rid of the highs and the lows there. So um, for general industry, for what we're talking about today, the Department of Labor has a trigger point of four feet um, or 48 inches, depending on which part of which section of the subpart you look at. So um, what we're looking at here is that less than six feet. Um, the issue becomes when I have a maintenance person or a warehouse person that goes and does something out of the ordinary, a job out of the ordinary, and accidents happen or something happens, and they uh, ends up being a serious injury or fatality. So, um, This slide right here, this is uh, what we call a fat cat. Um, this is actually one page out of the uh, physical year 15 fatalities. So what OSHA does is they keep track of how many fatalities by day. And when I went in and, and I picked this particular page, I looked from January 1 through the end of March, and I looked at every page, and every page had at least one fall 
fatality on it. This particular one had had several of them, and again, um, you have access to these. You can go to the OSHA dot web um, website and 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 actually take a look at these. But uh, the interesting thing is, I was going through the fat cats here to pick out a a page for this. Was that there was a fall fatality on every page. So. Um, if you look at uh, the heading here, it says PFPS. What does that stand for? That actually stands for Personal Fall Protection System. And the key word in this whole process here is called the system. And, and basically when we're talking about fall protection, that's what it is. It's, it's a process or a system. So to make this as easy as I can, what I usually talk about was the worker, if they're going to be working at height, has three options for a job. And those three options are, I can either set myself up for restraint application, positioning application, or fall arrest. Okay, so the individual that I have here standing in a, an order picker is using a, an SRL with a full body harness. Now, as I look at that picture, somebody that works in, in fall protection, I looked at that picture and I said, that individual's harness needs to be a little bit tighter, what we call needs to be snugged up. And in a restraint application, if the SRL he is using is a six-foot SRL, which that one happens to be, if he's out at that six-foot distance, then he limits any more free fall or any more capability of, of falling. If he only has two or three feet out of that SRL, he has the possibility of having a, a, a slight fall or what we would call a free fall. A little bit later on in the program, I'm going to show you a restraint application that um, is not not a good application, and I'll show you the differences here between what we have on this picture and what we have coming up. So, restraint. The whole idea of restraint is to restrain the worker so that there is no fall. And how you do that is pretty much set um, by your individual uh, organizations. The second job application is called positioning, and that's where the um, person, the worker, gets connected up so it allows hands-free work. So as I'm in my slide here, it talks about it being vertical positioning. So the example I give people is like a pole climber. Guy goes up a pole, has a positioning device around the pole, leans back and, and uses their hands to work on electric wires or telephone wires or some type of a job. Now the Department of Labor tells us by law that the free fall distance in a positioning application cannot be more than two feet. So you're limiting the distance of travel. That means that my anchor point can be a 3,000 pound anchor point by a competent person or two times the maximum resting force by a qualified person. So that leads us into the definitions of an authorized person, a competent person, and a qualified person. Those are the three terminologies that the Department of Labor gives us as the workers. So an authorized person, somebody that the employer authorizes to perform some type of work or to work at some particular location. The competent person is the person that is the go-to person for the authorized person. That is person that, that fills something like a management or a supervisory role. It does not have to be a management person, but it, that's the representation that they're looking at for the competent person. And then your qualified person is somebody that has the knowledge, training, experience, and so forth to be able to um, document or to be able to figure out the task or the problems at hand. So where do we go here? If I'm a competent person and I'm looking at being able to anchor or put an anchor connector on something, I have to say, okay, if I'm going to free fall up to two feet, that structure that I'm connecting to must be able to support a 3,000 pound load. Now, if I don't think it will as a competent person, I go to a qualified person and say, hey, look, I don't think it's going to support that force or that load that, that, that that's going to see, then that qualified person, who is usually some type of an engineering type person, will say, okay, let me figure out the weights, let me figure out the loads, how far are they going, what kind of stresses, what kind of tension, what kind of forces are we going to see. They come up with a number, they take two times that number, that's the maximum force. They take two times that number, and that's what that anchor point is engineered or designed to be able to support. Okay, so each one of these, restraint, positioning, and fall arrest, uses those three applications of an authorized person, a competent person, and a qualified person. 
So the key thing here is a 2,000, or excuse me, a two-foot free fall and a 3,000-pound anchor point by a competent person. The third and final job application is fall arrest. So I'm looking at my work and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to wear fall arrest application here. It means I need to pick the right anchor point, the right anchor connector, the right style of harness, and the right connecting to point connecting device, and we're going to get into that here in a couple minutes. So in fall arrest, the Department of Labor allows us to go six feet. Now, my comment is, just because they allow you six feet, why would you want to do that? So when we talk about connecting devices, if I pick a lanyard, and I pick a six-foot lanyard, and I could do the job with a three-foot lanyard, why would I not take a three-foot lanyard? I would have less freefall distance. Okay, so six feet is that maximum number that the Department of Labor allows us to go. Now, with that, because we are free falling or yelling, cussing, or swearing distance, the anchor point has to be a stronger or heavier anchor point. So that anchor point goes to 5,000 pounds, and that's by a competent person, or if I, as a competent person, don't think that that anchor um, that I'm going to be using will support that 5,000 pound load, then I go to my qualified person and they engineer and say, okay, we're going to certify this particular anchor point here two times that maximum resting force and they sign off on it. And only the qualified person can change the 3,000 and 5,000 pound anchor point. All right, now, the point I want to make here is if I can get individuals to understand those three job applications, it makes your job a lot easier trying to decide what type of equipment will I use. Meaning, if I take a look at it and say, okay, I'm going to need a full body harness and I can get away full body harness with a restraint ring, right, with well, the restraint uh, D-ring is a restraint device, I can re get or use a restraint cable or I'm going to need some type of an energy absorbing device either in a retractable unit or in a lanyard. Okay, so um, you can go to the manufacturer's websites and you can look at their equipment and if they say this is for fall arrest, this is positioning, you're narrowing down your options that you have when you classify your work or your job um, by the way the manufacturers produce the equipment that's available to you. All right, so those are the three job applications. So no matter what job you're going to do, those are the three that you look at. Now we take a look at the personal fall protection system, and we look at four key areas. A is anchors, B is body wear, C is connecting device, and R is the rescue plan. So I'm going to start off with the rescue plan. I'm going to have a couple slides and talk about that here in a minute. But the reason I'm starting off with the rescue plan is if you're going to work at height, you need to have an idea or a plan on how you're going to get yourself down or how somebody's going to get you down. What you don't want to do is go work and something would happen and you fall and now somebody's got to get you down and you have no plan. Now we don't have time in this program to talk about suspension, trauma, or orthostatic intolerance, but the longer you hang, the worse it gets. You get blood pooling in the lower extremities and it your, uh, physiologically for your body, it does not go well. So the reason I'm starting off with a rescue plan is this. Before you work at height, you ought to have an idea how you're going to get down or how somebody is going to rescue you or, or help you get down. So with that, we'll go right into the, the ABCs and we'll go right into the anchor. So you understand how the fall protection manufacturer's lingo works. We talk about an anchor point as the strong structural heavy components, your beams, your columns, those kind of things. Anything that you attach to or connect to that anchor point, the structural members or the strength members, is called an anchor connector. So things such as beam clamps, cross arm straps, wire hooks, and so forth. Anything that I'm going to attach to my anchor point. So again, you're looking at the manufacturer's websites and they're talking about anchor points and you say, well, I don't want anchor points, I want anchor connectors. So some manufacturers will classify those devices that you can purchase as anchor connectors. The two families or the two classifications of those are what we call permanent and temporary. So a couple examples that I have for you here, these two examples here are what we call permanent 
anchor points. I've had students disagree with me and said, well, those are semi-permanent anchor points because you can unscrew them and take them down. And I said, okay, I'm not going to split hairs with you. You're absolutely correct. But the comment that I give to them is if you're going to take those down, I would be very careful because if you follow the manufacturer's instructions, you have to put those in, tighten them down, and there's a torque value. So the, the, the device on the right-hand side here, um, if you're going to, those are, um, looks like grade 5 hex head bolts there on that one. Uh, my recommendation, if you're going to take it down and move it, is purchase new bolts and nuts and lock washers and everything else and retorque with the new ones. So, but that's a couple examples of the permanent. This page has uh, three examples of uh, temporary anchor connector. Um, the old cross arm strap on the uh, left hand side there, that's been the old mainstay for years. Um, and believe it or not, you can get those in other sizes besides six feet. So manufacturers will actually make those in whatever length that you want those. Again, that could be a special order, but they come in, in multiple lengths depending on the job application that you're going to use it for. Now, the example that I have, that's the reason I like this picture, is when you wrap the cross arm strap around, if you notice that we have the webbing wrapped on webbing, wrapped on webbing, wrapped on webbing. And the idea of that is it gives us some cushion or some gauze, if you will, when somebody decides to fall in this thing. So when they fall on that lower ring, that webbing will actually tighten down right down on itself. The right hand side shows a couple different beam clamps. Um, the one on the top there with the, the aluminum ring coming off of it is a uh, a trailing beam clamp. It's actually designed to slide along a um, an I-beam or an H-beam. The red one underneath it, I call it the seat clamp. Clamp. We have num model numbers for them, but um, that particular one is designed that I can tighten right down. So it's kind of going to, going to be stationary. So we're actually showing that in a vertical application. Some applications I've seen those used in a horizontal application, which it can be. It, you can tighten it right down onto a beam someplace. Okay, so that's anchors, anchor connectors. We take a look at body wear is the B, and the reason that we call it body wear is because, believe it or not, there's still restraint belts made, there's body belts made, there's positioning belts made, and then what we're talking about here today is what we call a full body harness. So what you want to do when you look at your full body harness is you want that full body harness to be able to do the type of work that you're going to wear it for. So some uh, three key features you want to look at is the back strap and the chest strap. And again, the idea of the back strap and the chest strap is not only to hold the shoulder straps in, it's to keep you from rolling out the back and rolling out the front. The idea of the subpelvic strap, again, if you take the subpelvic strap is to go underneath your pelvic bones in your posterior area. And the idea of that is to take the, the loads or the forces that you're creating when you decide to fall and taking it and dividing it between the two leg straps or the crotch straps and your subpelvic strap. So it doesn't necessarily work like that, but the way I explain it is we're trying to take that total load that you're creating, that force that you're creating, and dividing it by three. And then the other thing to consider here is I'm using the sliding D-ring as an example, but if you're using a particular type of harness that has a stationary ring, you need to make sure that that D-ring is up near your shoulder blades so you can take your right or left hand, reach back and grab that dorsal D-ring and grab a hold of it on your back. Okay, That means that it's up in where it needs to be. If a sliding D-ring is not up where it is and you fall, it has the luxury of being able to slide towards your head. If you have a stationary D-ring or even a full pad harness, they're a little bit harder to slide. If you have those, the tendency of the material sliding through that pad is very limited. So uh, instead of you falling as straight up and down as you can, you may slide on an, on an angle. ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, actually tells us that when we do our testing that the, the mannequin that we use is not allowed to be beyond a, a 30 degree angle. So there's ANSI actually has a, a, a degree for us that we have to um, be able to uh, identify when we do our, our testing and, and proofing of our equipment. Um, anybody looking for any information? Again, I mentioned ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. They have a new body wear standard out. It's actually Z359.11. And 
a lot of the changes that were made in that gear more towards us manufacturers and what we do and how we do things. But one of the key areas for you, the user, is the subpelvic felt uh, subpelvic strap. All harnesses now, meeting the ANSI standard, will have a subpelvic strap, and that was released as of uh, January 1 of of uh, 2014. All right, so I, I threw in a couple pictures here. Um, the picture on the left is uh, a young lady. That's actually a, a what we call a Ms. Miller harness. That's actually a, a harness that's designed for a female. Uh, females' um, organs are a little bit different than a male, so instead of having crotch straps, we have leg straps for them. And the harness on the right-hand side is an example where I have positioning rings, and I have a solid stitched chest strap with a ring on it, and that individual, that type or style of harness would be used for somebody that does a lot of ladder climbing or does a lot of work off of that front ring. It would also have both harnesses that I'm showing here would also have a dorsal D-ring, but this particular one on the right-hand side here actually has the positioning rings on the front and the sternum ring on the uh, very chest area there for uh, a lot of work, uh, ladder climbing, that kind of stuff. All right, so that's the, the body wear examples that I have for you. Then the uh, C, you know, we had anchor, anchor connectors, body for B, and we have connecting devices for the C. So it's the ABCs, a personal fall protection system. So the industrial term is called a lanyard. Lanyards can come in wire rope, synthetic rope, or synthetic webbing. Um, the Department of Labor tells us that any of the rope and webbing material that we use must be from synthetic fibers. So the old days, and I go back to those days, I'm old enough to remember when we'd use manila and sisal, those days are gone. So no natural fibers of, of any kind. It has to be synthetic. ANSI, in their standard, actually says that any of the synthetic materials that we use must be virgin synthetics. So ANSI actually goes a, a, a step further than what the Department of Labor does. Um, retractable units, SRL, self-retracting lanyards, self-retracting lanyards, yo-yos, blocks, those are all terms to identify the SRL or the retractable units. They come in wire cable and synthetic webbing. And they come in varying lengths. Usually the low side, the, the short distance, is usually about a six foot. And then they go up into the 200 foot uh, or even some over. So usually a lot of manufacturers have kind of settled out around the 200 foot and varying lengths there that is the top length. But th there is some produced, and we manufacture some for particular applications, um, maybe for a, a derrick or something like that where you might get a little bit longer. Now, in a retractable unit, and the lanyards operate a little bit different here. And we're going to talk about a little bit of fall protection here when I get going into or fall clearance when we get into the different lengths of what these units can, can um, extend to. The Department of Labor, OSHA, tells us that any of the energy absorbers, which used to be called shock absorbers, and we were, um, I used to do a fair amount of international travel and international training and service work, and we were one of very few countries that called um, shock absorbers shock absorbers. Most of the countries called them energy absorbers. So ANSI in their latest rewrite has uh, changed that terminology, and now we call them energy absorbers. So the Department of Labor says the maximum force that you're allowed to see on your body is 1,800 pounds. ANSI comes out and says, well, 1,800 pounds is okay, but we want to cut that in half. So, Mr. Manufacturer, your number is, if you're building equipment, we want you to be in that 900-pound area. So the maximum force that you're going to see on your torso, by law, should be 1,800 pounds. By ANSI, 900 pounds. Okay, so those are the, and that number, again, wasn't picked out of the sky. That number, we know when you start to get into the high two. 2,000 or 3,000 and above pounds of force, depending on how your body is manufactured and made, you can have some severe internal injuries. So um, basically, as I tell people, what makes the difference whether you fall and hit the ground or you fall on the end of your restraint device or the end of your lanyard or you fell a considerable distance and you tear your internal, internal organs and you bleed to death hanging on a, on a rope or a, a cable or something. So. 
Um, the other connecting device that seems to be pretty popular in, in, the, um, in your industry, in the general industry, is rope grabs. Uh, we manufacturers actually call those fall arresters, which is kind of the, 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 um, the proper term for them because that's what you're trying to do with a rope grab, is you're trying to arrest your fall. And those are done by um, synthetic rope or a wire cable. Now, if we break the uh, fall arresters or the rope grabs down into families, you have manual units and you have trailing units. So the biggest way to explain those is if I'm climbing and I'm using a trailing unit, that's what it does is it trails me up a rope or a wire rope. If I'm using a manual unit, that means I manually have to do something to get it to go up the rope. So if I'm going up a, a fixed cable and I'm going to use a manual unit, that means I need to slide it up above me as I'm, as I'm climbing. So you manually operate it. So those are the two um, families. that, And then there's anti-panic and there's a lot of other options that you get with those. But that's the basics of it is you can get a manual unit, trailing unit. And again, it can be for synthetic rope or wire cable. And the popular cables are 8, 9, and 10 millimeter. Those are the popular size of, of cables. Now, where do we go here with the lanyards and distances? So uh, I'm going to show you a chart here in a couple minutes that shows the extension of your lanyards. So three foot and six foot energy absorbing lanyards seem to be most popular lengths. Can I get lengths different than that? Absolutely. Work with your fall protection manufacturer. If you need something longer or you need something shorter, that can be done. But usually the three and the six are the most popular off the shelf. Now, with an energy absorber, or a shock absorber, or some people still call them, there is a, an extension that that energy absorber or that shock pack can go. Now, we actually call that deceleration distance. So if I have a six-foot lanyard and I have a deceleration device or an energy absorber on it, that becomes my fall arrest connecting device that deceleration distance that's built into that energy absorber or that shock pack is set. If you notice, I have three different numbers up there. OSHA and the old ANSI standard were set at three and a half feet. The new ANSI standard went to four feet. And then if I have an application where I have to anchor below my dorsal D-ring or I am greater than 310 pound working weight, then I have to go to a super pack or a big boy pack or what we call max pack. That can go 60 inches or obviously 5 feet. That is a special unit, special application. The whole idea is to anchor above your dorsal D-ring. So what we say in our industry when we tell people to hook up, we mean hook up and that means up in the air. And when you're hooking up in the air, that means you're hooking your snap hook or your carabiner. So the definition of deceleration device, and I have it here for you, is the distance from where your deceleration device or your energy absorber activates until you come to a complete stop. So hopefully, hopefully I can uh, kind of clear this up by telling you if I have a six-foot energy absorbing lanyard, it may go nine and a half feet. If I have a four foot, an ANSI Z359.13 energy absorber, it could go 10 feet. Okay, so a lot, and I still run into workers that think they buy a six foot energy absorbing lanyard that if they fall, they're going to go six feet. Well, that's not the case. You have to have, you have to move that load or that force that you created over distance to reduce the energy or the force that you're going to see on your body. And we do that by extending you out or deceleration distance. So it doesn't matter whether you use the inline or what we call the tubular style, when I have both pictures up here for you, that it doesn't matter whether you use that one or you use the old reliable pack style. These were the, the popular ones way back in the day. Um, they both, both styles do the same process. They do the same work. They go the same distances, everything the same. It, can be, it comes down to, do I like an inline or tubular or do I like a a shock pack or an energy pack. Uh, which one do I like? Now, the one on the left-hand side, um, energy absorbing lanyard there, is has a, a blue uh, case over it. That blue case is actually uh, Nomex with Nomex thread. 
So at one time I was a welder, and this is the type of um, connecting device that I used when I worked at Hythe. If I was going to use a lanyard, um, that's the one I used because as I was welding, my sparks would go down and it would roll off this. If I used the one on the right-hand side, which is a vinyl, um, sometimes some manufacturers will put plastic cases on there. Your your hot embers will stick to it. So the one on the left is uh, for the maintenance guys. Maybe if they're doing hot work, might be where they want to go with that. Um, I put a slide in here in the program on double leg lanyards. The interesting thing on double leg lanyards, up until 2007, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, had no standards on them. So. Uh, they had a case in Australia where a worker set a double leg lanyard up. Um, instead of hooking it up correctly, he, he hooked it up with the two um, rebar hooks or the large opening snap hooks that you see there spread apart. He fell. The way that manufacturer had their donut where the two legs come together, it exploded or come apart and he fell to his death. So um, 2007 forward, we have uh, standards on how double leg lanyards or energy absorbers to be built. So the reason I put this slide in here is that is not a connection point for two people. And believe it or not, I see people where, well, here, you connect this to your dorsal D-ring and I'll connect to the big hook, I'll connect to that and we'll both be on the same energy absorber. It doesn't work like that. This unit is a individual unit. It's for one worker. It just gives you that 100% connection capability. So I hook up and I walk and move. I hook my other hook and then disconnect the one, the first hook, and then I walk or move or go someplace, hook my second hook and disconnect my first hook again. So the idea is to be able to walk or to move and maintain 100% connection. So that's the idea. And when we start looking at racking here a little bit, um, the double leg lanyard and, and some risk assessments that I've done for some distribution centers and stuff, I've kind of, well, we're going to have to go with a level leg. If you're going to allow your worker to leave that uh, that order picker, you're going to allow them to go back in those racks. I don't know that you'd want to do that, but if you're going to allow them, you're probably going to have to look at something like a double leg system. And some, man, some of us manufacturers make retractables in double leg systems also. A um, couple uh, a couple little examples I give you here. People will say, well, what's the shortest lanyard I can get? And I threw an example here on the bottom. It says hybrid soft stop. But this is actually 18 inches. This is just a little bit shorter than 18 inches. So that's actually the, the shortest one that, that, that we can make. Um, and it has that, uh, you've got to have that energy pack in there. And then we've got a snap hook on one end. We've got to have a connection point on the other. The other uh, lanyard above there, is a double leg lanyard. This one has the bungee cord style of legs, so it gives you that little elasticity, but your energy absorber is actually that white pack that you see there. And that white pack is a, a special application. That's the one that I mentioned to you that is for somebody that exceeds a 310 pound working weight or is going to free fall greater than six feet. And the steel rings that you see there, I, I'm going to call them rescue rings. But the idea of those rings is it gives me another connection point, or if my worker has fallen and I have a rescue plan and I'm going to retrieve them, either raise them up or lowering down, I might be able to use those rings to make this my connection point using some type of a rescue pole or some type of device to connect to it. So, um, Chokeable lanyards. Probably one of the areas that, that I see lanyards misused the most is People will take their lanyard and they'll take their hook, snap hook, and go around something, hook it back into the webbing. The only time that is allowed is if you have what I'm calling a chokeable lanyard. Okay, so um, any of the, uh, depending on what whose manufacturer you're using, um, the snap hooks are not designed to be snapped back onto themselves unless they have the capabilities or are designed to be a chokeable. So in the pictures I have here, if you notice, this is, happens to be one of ours. We have a flat spot on our on our snap hook. So when you choke it back onto itself, when you fall in it, that webbing is going to hit that flat spot. It doesn't matter where it's at within that hook, it's going to go to the flat spot. So I would highly recommend, depending on what manufacturer that you're using, that you make sure and um, if you want a chokeable unit, make sure you're buying the the, the correct chokeable lanyard for that application. So just be careful. Any other lanyard that's not a chokeable one, 
you're, you stand a chance of uh, shearing the, the webbing from the forces that you're creating in your fall. So um, this is a, a, a little picture here dealing with the, the, what I just went through with on the left hand side the green lanyard you see there is the tubular style. Um, six foot lanyard with a three and a half foot deceleration distance built into it so when it stretches out that particular unit there can go nine and a half feet. Again if I have a four footer deceleration or an energy absorber it could go to ten feet. And on the left or the right hand side of the, the, the screen there showing the yellow lanyard, that's the pack style, there's no difference. So my energy absorber in a tubular style is inside the tube. On the pack style it's actually packed up and, and uh, covered over with that little pack that you see there. Now different manufacturers will do different ways of, of ripping out or tearing out or ripping stitches. There's different ways that different manufacturers will extend that three and a half or four foot out on their the deployed piece. So, key thing is, when we talk about fall clearance that you you need to keep in mind here is your energy absorber six or your energy absorbing lanyard six foot. You're going more distance than six feet, and you have to include that in on your fall clearance calculation when you're saying okay how far up and 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 on fall clearance the the thing you have to be careful with there is is low distances. So if I am in low heights, I should say, if I'm uh, six feet off the floor, how am I going to protect myself? If I'm 10 feet off the floor, how am I going to protect myself? So there is actually applications, and I tell people that even using a self-retracting lanyard or lifeline, which is the pictures that I have up here for you now, um, if you're at a low distance, below height, it's going to hurt. So again, some people, there's companies out there that say, well, if you're above a four-foot trigger point on a step ladder and we require you to have the full body protection, you got to have a connecting, you got to have an anchor point and if you're trying to use a, a three foot or a six foot energy absorbing lanyard, if you're ten foot up a step ladder it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. So you stand a chance with an SRL and again they're, they're limited. A um, couple different varieties that I have up here. The one on the right hand side of the screen is a what we call a personal fall limiter, PFL. So it's a it's small, small little six foot unit. The other one on the left hand side is a longer unit, 30, 50, 65 footer, and again you can get those in different lengths. So when you're dealing with an SRL, this is the, the requirements and this is what you need to keep in mind. ANSI requires a self-retracting lanyard to lock up within two foot. So the way to look at that is if I fall, I go, ah, and I fall two feet, that unit has to lock up within that two feet. After it locks up, depending on the braking systems or the lockup systems in those, it can go another two and a half feet. So if you take two foot and two and a half and add those two together, that gives you the four and a half feet. Or if you would look at your SRL, look at the tag, you'll see on there maximum rest distance 54 inches. And the reason for the 54 inches is because ANSI writes everything in inches in their standards. So there's a couple other ones on the market. One of the smaller units that I had uh, that I showed you, the little PFL, it's a 24 inch unit. So we don't sell it as a 12 and 12, a 12, uh, 12 inch or a 12 inch lockup. We sell it as a 24 inch maximum resting distance. And then there's a 39 as another one. Those are the three popular ones here in the States. So a good assortment, the, the one on the left is a six footer, I've got the ten foot, uh, I call that the seat belt retractable unit, and then you've got a nine foot unit, they come in different lengths, sixteen and twenty, the only way on the sixteen and twenty, you're going to know sixteen, twenty, thirty, or twenty, um, fifty, sixty, but the only way you're going to know is to be able to look at the tag. So, and, it, and, it, and understand, it doesn't matter how far up my SRL is above me, it's going to operate just as I said. If I'm standing and I fall, it's got to lock up within two feet and decelerate no more than two and a half feet. Okay, rope grabs or fall arresters. This is a couple examples that you that I have here. The the uh, one on the left hand side and the one in the middle are both trailing units, and the one on the right hand side with the individual snooking, uh, connecting their uh, snapping their snap hook to it that that is a manual unit. So again, for wire rope or synthetic rope. So um, trailing units I climb, it trails me or follows me. Usually you use a short connection device or a short lanyard when you're using 
rope grabs if you're going to trail. Again, you don't want it to be too far below your dorsal D-ring. Um, this is a uh, slide that I put in here dealing with testing and just kind of summarize everything we've talked about to this point. Um, we were doing testing with a 220-pound steel weight free-falling six feet. And we tested steel lanyards, web lanyards, and nylon rope lanyards, and you'll see the forces on there. So if you, you remember, I mentioned to you, once you start to get up into the high 2000s and 3000, your, your internal organs aren't going to be able to, to, to uh, be able to support that, that force that they're seeing. So the only way that you're going to protect yourself is to have some type of an energy absorber in your system. Here I'm talking about an energy absorbing lanyard. So we tested a bunch one day and averaged out at about 830 pounds. So OSHA says 1800. ANSI says 900, so on this day when we averaged and did our testing, we were well below the, the 900 pounds of force that you would see on your body. All right, so we talked about anchors, body wear connecting devices. The R, and I mentioned earlier, is the rescue plan. Left-hand side of the screen, there's all different types of rescue um, units available on the market. I just threw a couple on here for, the, for this program. So I have what we call a quick pick. It has a rescue pole that telescopes and and uh, stretches out, and you can connect to your worker, and I have a, a rescue ladder seems to be a popular device that some workers, but the key area that I want to concentrate it for you there is you must have some type of a rescue plan when you're going to work at height. So the rest, uh, the rest of the webcast here, I'm, I've got a few pictures that I want to go through and just talk about some of the things that I see when I do risk assessments at distribution centers or warehousing areas or workers working on order pickers. So this uh, warehouse or racks that you see right here, I've got workers connecting up to that racking. So as I look at that racking, if they use that as an anchor point, structurally as I look at that, that is not going to support their load, especially if they fall any distance at all. So it's just not as easy as taking and connecting up to a column or connecting up to a, a, a beam going across. Same thing with this one. The worker's going to look at it and say, well, I've got some pretty heavy columns here. I've got some pretty heavy beams, so how about if I connect up to this column? You know, when you look at racking like this, to me it's no different than scaffolding. And when I look at scaffolding, the, the columns or the legs of the scaffolding, just like the legs on here, that is to support the load that is above it pushing down on it. And now all of a sudden you take and connect up to the stuff and you fall, you're falling outward instead of downward, you're going to cause forces on these columns and beams here that, that are not required to take that kind of force. So um, this was another picture from a, a warehouse and um, you see there's a, a, a reach truck or a lift truck down in there and they're taking a, a box off it. But what I want use this picture for is over on the left hand, upper left hand corner, if you notice there's a ventilation system over there. So my warehousing people may not use or get off and get into the racks, but my, where, but my maintenance people might say, well, if I just crawl up on these racks and I can get up there and I can work on that ventilation system, I can work on that sprinkler system, or I can go work on those lighting systems. So maintenance people don't look at these as warehousing, they look at them as a work platform. So Again, the, 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 the problem there may be, especially if they're using that and they, they fall, it's not going to be a good day for somebody. Um, this is an oven, and same thing um, that I talk about uh, workers, obviously the operators of these usually stay on the ground, but my maintenance people will get up above. If you notice, there's all kinds of duct work, there's all kinds of ventilation stuff, um, electrical conduit, there's all kinds of things that they get up there and walk around. So. Um, obviously, the height of this oven and the temperature of this oven is obviously not conducive to the type of work that some maintenance people would uh, would want to be around or want to do. So, um, I guess uh, when I talked about uh, recognizing the job, uh, evaluating it, and doing control, um, you got to take and plan your work and think about the work that you're doing. So this site, this picture here, has um, got guardrails. It's got uh, uh, steps or stairs with uh, stair rails going up to it. So, um, you know, that not too bad of an operation as long as you keep your feet on your work platform. And as soon as you look and say, okay, how about if I step up on step up on the mid rail? How about if I step on the top rail and then I'll connect to something? That stepping up concept or is uh, probably not a good thing. So. 
um, again, take a look at the work, take a look at the jobs that you have, and uh, recognize the, the issues, evaluate is it low, moderate, high risk, and then put your control steps. Your control steps, again, what type of equipment am I going to use? What type of harness am I going to use? Um, ladders, I've got two examples of fixed ladders here. Obviously, the individual on the left is using a cage with a, a cable system and a rope grab. The individual on the right is a free-for-all. Um, he's got the ladder, he's got to go through a gate, so as he gets up to the top step, he's got to reach through and grab a hold of something behind the gate to get through there. So um, we manufacturers make cable systems or rail systems that you can apply on that fixed ladder that you see there. So um, again, probably um, not the safest technique. Uh, the individual on the right needs to think about what they're doing there. This shows a, a, an individual working in an order picker and if you notice, it's, it might be hard for you to see, but if you look up into the bunk or the head, head rack there, you'll notice there's an SRL. And, and I studied this picture. It's not one of my pictures, but I've studied and studied. I cannot find any type of fall protection or body wear on this individual at all. So the workers have to do what they have to do to protect themselves. So they have to be able to do it. If, if the company buys the equipment and the employer decides to, or the employee decides not to wear it, all bets are off what's going to happen. So. Um, I talked about restraint positioning and fall arrest earlier. So the picture on the left here shows a young lady on an order picker in a restraint application using a restraint belt. Restraint belts are perfectly okay, except her restraint device is too long. If she would fall off that order picker, there's about, if you measure that, there's probably about three or four feet. That's going to cause considerable forces to her abdominal region. So she either needs to go with an SRL or she needs to go to a shorter restraint device to shorten that up so that she can't fall off that order picker. The individual on the right hand side, I've studied this picture, it's again not one of my pictures, in fact I believe I took this from a manufacturer of uh, order pickers, but I can't see where his leg straps are adjusted. So the reason I threw this one in here was if you get down on the ground and you decide to release the leg straps because they're too tight, and then you get back in to go do your job or get up on the order picker, don't forget to tighten up your leg straps again. The concept that we use here is we tell people that the harness is either on or it's off. So if you're going to loosen up the straps, take it off. If you're going to put it on and you're going to work at height, then make sure all of the straps and everything are connected up. Um, this is a, a little bit different uh, application here. We've eliminated, eliminated the D-ring and put a short lanyard in for the individual. This is actually back in our warehouse here. So again, he's using an, an order picker here, using one of our little scorpions. So um, even though you know a lot of manufacturers, a lot of us sell the dorsal D-ring, we make special applications where you can get short lanyards or you can get a six-foot lanyard stitched right onto your harness and that way the worker has no which do I need or what do I choose. I kind of like this picture here because it shows the individual getting off the order picker and getting up to the mattresses. So my concept here, he is connected, he's got an SRL there, and the concept here is if you fall, you want to fall into a, a bunch of mattresses. So those would be like air cushions, like that stunt people fall into. But um, What you have to be careful with is when you leave that order picker, and if you look at the way they have the mattresses stacked in this, um, on these racks, if you notice the one behind where he's taking here, it's actually stacked in. So if he's going to, he's got to get off his order picker and go get that mattress and come back and throw it back on his skid or his pallet. So uh, again, when you start to leave, you need to, you need to think about: Am I connected up? If I fall, where am I going to fall, and how am I going to fall? You know, is my unit going to, going to, going to lock up and, and, and protect me? Um, this picture I threw in here, this is an example of a, a unit that goes into a, a lift truck or an order picker. It actually bolts right up into a particular manufacturer. So we manufacturers make and design this type of unit. So there is units that will fit right into that head, head uh, or the bunk up above you there as you're working. Um, final comments I'm going to make is uh, people working on the ground, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a percentage of people in the United States that die working on, on ground level. They fall, hit their heads, do something else. With it. But again, the, the capabilities of people getting up, as I tell people, if you're going to work above this racking or above this machine, take a look at scissor lifts, take a look at vertical platforms, take a look at 
any type of device that makes a good stable work platform. If you're looking at ladders, my recommendation is use portable ladders last as far as your working at height device. Um, the concept here is what I'm showing you. Everybody's got a ladder, so nobody needs training on ladders. And if you go look at the fatalities that are released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number one work device that has the most fatalities that we use as workers are ladders. So, and then like I said, why do I need ladder training? I got a ladder at home. I know how to use them. So, um, it's the highest fatality rate of all of the equipment that we use um, in, in, in the employment or the jobs that we do. So, again, stable platforms like your scissor lifts, aerial lifts, your, your um, order pickers or your, and staying on them, that kind of stuff. So, all right. So, um, Mike, uh, I think uh, open for questions and answers, I guess. Okay, John, I uh, just got a couple of questions for you okay. here. Looks like they'll be able to get them in. Uh, first one is uh, fall protection is commonly cited by OSHA, in fact, the second most cited uh, violation. Do you have uh, an idea of what those citations are commonly written for? Um, yeah, I will do, I will answer that by my unofficial research. The number one fatality that I see in the number one uh, OSHA citation is they aren't, the worker is not using anything. And, and you, you might find that hard to believe, but believe it or not, we have people that it's one of those like five or ten minutes or I can do this as a quickie, so I'm going to go jump off and do that and come back and they're not protected and they fall and get hurt. But um, the other thing is, is if I'm using the equipment, I may not be using the correct equipment. So I referenced that little max pack or that unit that's designed for somebody that exceeds 310 pound working weight and that's OSHA and ANSI both. That's their working weighted number that they use for their load. Um, if I'm using a, if, I'm, if I've got to connect below my dorsal D-ring because there isn't any, any other place to connect and I'm using a standard energy absorbing lanyard, the forces are going to exceed what that unit's designed to see. So if they're using the wrong equipment for the application that they're applying it to, that's another citation. So. Oh, another question here, John. Uh, where should I look to find good information on recommended rescue techniques and developing rescue plans? Okay. Uh, that is a very good question. So there is several manufacturers, and we all have different types of rescue equipment available. Um, one of the issues that I run into there is a lot of times I will get um, public safety or first response terminology and technologies into the industrial world. What do I mean by that? In industrial applications, we call that rope access accessing. In the public safety or first response world, we call that repelling and belaying. Those two terms aren't used in industrial. And a lot of times our industrial people will try to bring that first response stuff over into industry. So what industry is required to do is they're required to look at where their workers are going to be working at height and say, okay, what type of rescue plan or rescue equipment do we need? So we make uh, retrievable devices. We make rescue poles. There is rope ladders. There is, I've used... Uh, rope that I've dropped down beside me on a job so that if something happens all I've got to do is latch over, connect to my rope, grab to the rope and I can either go down or I can climb up. Again, there's different techniques that we can use there, but in industry, in the OSHA world, again, the employer is required to have some type of a rescue plan and that rescue plan, and my recommendation is what we did, I worked in the petrochemical industry for a while, is we brought our teams together and say, okay guys, in this particular area, what are we going to do, how are we going to how are we going to do perform a rescue if somebody gets hung up in this area? And and again, we 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 wrote up a, a procedure on how to do that. So, you know, I I use I don't quite understand how. I guess because it's not in an OSHA law, but if I reference something like a lockout tagout, you know, 19, 1910-147, and I'm looking at that, it says okay, if I'm going to operate this machine, I've got to have a procedure on how to secure the energy. 
why don't we have that when we're working at height? If I'm going to work in this area or in this machine, I have to do step one, two, three, and four. Okay, and in general industry, that's fairly easy to do. You know, if I look at other industries like the construction industry, since their work is pretty dynamic, sometimes that's a little bit harder to do. But in a general industry, in a in a in a in a maintenance application in a in a fixed building, why don't we have a set plan for step one, step two, step three, step four? So. Uh, OSHA doesn't have a whole lot on their website for rescue, so there is uh, rescue companies out there. I just I, I just want to make sure that you be careful if you're going to look at first responder type rescue versus industrial rescue. So we provide a couple training sessions. We call it basic and advanced. So there's companies out there that do industrial rescue. All right. Looks like we got time for one more question here, John. Uh, okay. OSHA or ANSI provide any guidance on the correct anchor connectors, bodywear, and connecting devices to use for common fall protection activities? Um, I'm not sure what common fall protection activities. Um, I'm going to guess just what, the, what the question is getting to is for uh, Standard activities that take place at height, does OSHA or ANSI have any resources that provide guidance on um, connectors or other, bodywork? No, the way, to, the, way to look at, the way to look at OSHA and ANSI is OSHA pretty much gives you the performance factors and then the employers required to meet those performance factors. ANSI does that to us manufacturers. They'll say, okay, you have to design this to meet this, and then it's up to the employer, up to the manufacturers, fall protection manufacturers, to design something that meets that ANSI standard. I kind of alluded to that a little bit when I talked about the way energy absorbers work, the rip out ones. You know, ours kind of rip apart. There's other ones that tear stitching. There's other ones that shred. They all do the same thing. They don't perform the same way, but they all have the end product, and they have to reduce the energy that, that that's the forces that are that are uh, created when the individual falls, and and the key thing here to remember is you know, a lot of people don't understand how much force and how short a distance. We do a drop test here of six inches, so you know we do six inch drop with a restraint device, and we use a 282 pound dead weight. We use it a mannequin, and we'll drop that mannequin six inches, and we'll get somewhere between 14 and 1700 pounds of force. So, you know, you don't have to fall very far to create a lot of force on your body. So and that's six inches, not six feet. That's the idea why we have energy absorbers in the system. So. All right. Well, we are getting close to the end of our hour here. Thank you, John, very much okay. for your time. And okay, thank well, you to all for attending today's webinar. In the near future, you will receive an email directing you to a replay of the webinar and the associated documents. Also watch your email for announcements about future webinars and be sure to visit the ASA website at www.asa.net for other safety related information. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar and have a safe day.